So if you were here yesterday on September 4th, then you provided data to the instructor on how you wanted to run the final exam. Does anybody know when the final exam is in, hist in history? In history? What, what day is it next week? Thursday the 12th. Yes, Thursday the 12th. All right. For those of you that weren't here yesterday, we got 100% consensus from every student that we had two choices on how to run the final exam. 40 questions, closed book, like normal tests, and you got 50 minutes. Or 20 questions, open note, but you only got 35 minutes. And I browbeat and kicked everyone in the shins who didn't agree so that it, until everyone agreed to a 20 question, I was just kidding, I physically abused no one. Uh, we're going to do a 20 question, open note, final exam, but you're only going to have 35 minutes. So what I recommend you do with your notes for history, this is for history, make sure your notes are all on to class, because if you don't bring them to class, you're going to have After eight history, it'll be college credit to get it done uh, by Friday. Grades to the college on Monday the 17th. I turn in grades, so the class has to be free. Then on Monday the 17th, the second hour will be careers in aviation, flight 103. Question. What about our history textbooks? You're welcome to start bringing them in. And yes, I would like to have them no later than Friday of next week. Everybody, if you're not going to, if you're finished doing the reading in your aviation history textbook, you can start bringing them in, and I can mark your name off, so the the school fascists won't come to your house in the middle of the night and knock on your door and ask for the book. And I just like those people. So, does anybody have any questions about the final exam? On Thursday, the 12th, 20 questions, open note. You better bring your notes, and you better have your notes organized, because if they're not organized, a lot of time flipping around. Here's the in order, like chapter one, early aviation, and then I'll have a couple of questions. Chapter 02, the Wright Brothers. Chapter 03, the Decade War One. Chapter 04, World War One. So if you have your notes labeled well, like I've been saying today, to that chapter, you'll read the question, you'll zoom down, and you'll write the answer down, and you'll go to the next one. So there's 10 chapters, it will be approximately questions. Anybody have any questions about that? What got brought up yesterday is that the question. history, I'll have a real good idea of what they're like. Okay, on the convert, to get to the place where we can take the final exam on Thursday, we're supposed to finish by space age aviation, and we're supposed to finish it today. So one way to help us do that is we're going to do what we did yesterday. We're going to read through all day today in aviation history. The difference is that like yesterday, and if you came in today or yesterday, I gave you two pieces of paper with in it, which are the Space Age Aviation note page. So effectively, I've printed and handed you a hard copy of the notes so you don't have to write as many things down. Not that you write things down. So, is anybody, so we're going to do that today. I think we'll be able to finish Space Age Aviation today, and we'll be able to schedule. We're scheduled to finish Space Age Aviation. Now, technically, it's not due until 2.20 this afternoon. But today is the day that essay number three is due. If you'd like to pass them in right now, like to wait until 2.20, I will remind you at 2.20. And please remember, if you don't turn it in, you have seven calendar days after today to turn it in on time. Correction. To turn it in for partial credit. And partial credit, since this is worth so much, partial credit is absolutely worth it. Okay, I'll remind you again at 2.20. 
All right, chapter 9, the space age. So we're at the Chinese, see you later, Jonathan. The Chinese were the first people known of with scientific data to have invented rockets because they invented gunpowder and they built rockets. Maybe at first fun, but certainly later they used it to launch rockets against enemies in battle. How effective those rockets were, I don't know. 50, that's a long time ago. That's a more. That's a, almost a thousand years ago. Robert Goddard was in the United States, so you could write that part down there for, for Mr. Goddard. He was a United States citizen working in the United States, and he was the first human on the planet to build and successfully fly a rocket that was made out of liquid fuel. It didn't have gunpowder. It had an oxidizer, and it had a fuel, and they were both liquid. So this was a big deal because in World War II, there were liquid. There was a liquid-powered rocket called the V-2, and it was used in warhead. I think the thing weighed like 10,000 pounds. 10, pounds. And they were launching Belgium and France across the English Channel to bomb with rockets. To bomb. It was like the predecessor of an intercontinental ballistic missile. This just went from one country to another, and of course, fortunately, it didn't have a nuclear warhead on it. But oh wait, there it is. The first. In the so the first mass-produced, you could argue this is also mass-produced, the rocket power, mass-produced rocket, was the V2. Unfortunately, obviously, it was designed as a weapon, but we have a lot of the fact that things in aviation now in space are advanced because governments during wartime will spend a lot of money trying to develop bigger and better weapons in an attempt to win the war. The downside of the V-2 rocket is that it wasn't guided. That is, they would launch it, and it had a gyroscope in it, so it would try to fly straight, but it didn't, couldn't hit a target. You couldn't say, I wanted to hit a target and have it hit it. So they aimed it, and they aimed them at London. They, it was one of the first, it was used as a terror weapon. It didn't really, you couldn't really blow up a railroad yard or uh, an airplane factory or a tank factory or a gasoline refinery. But London was really big, and so you could launch it, and it, would, might, it might hit London. And, of course, nobody has a good time when there's rockets coming down on top of you every night. Let's go forward to 1957. So 1957 is now 12 years after the war. So let's think about this. It's 12 years after World War II in 1957, and the first device that went into orbit around the Earth was a little satellite about a foot, foot and a half in diameter and had four antennas on it. And all it did was transmit radio, a radio signal. You know, dots and dashes probably. I, I need to look that up. And it was launched by the USSR. The USSR is the United Soviet Socialist Republics. We still tend to call it Russia or we call it the Soviet Union. But technically Russia was just a chunk of the USSR. 1957. Just to be clear, during that 12 years, guess what the United States did at the end of World War II? We grabbed as many German rocket scientists and as many German-built rockets, and we grabbed them and hauled them to the United States and said, you know, let's, for, let's forgive and forget. Become a U.S. citizen, and you can help us make rockets, just like you were doing for the last country you were doing it for. In fact, Werner von Braun... The gentleman who was the person in charge of the V-2 in Germany, he's the guy who was the overseeing the design of the Sat-5. Kennedy with Von Braun, where 15, 20 years earlier, he was bombs to draw to... What do we care? We want we want to have our missiles. So, so I think that's rather interesting that the first satellite into orbit. Oh wait, it wasn't Germany. They lost the war. It wasn't Great Britain. It wasn't even the United States. It was the S the USSR. Oh wait, 1959. If I recall correctly, there's somebody in here that did a report about the first device to fly around the backside of the moon. Literally, the first machine to get to the moon. It didn't land. It flew around it. 
holy mackerel, 1959. We hadn't even put anybody in space. The pictures were lousy. But a satellite, a rocket went all the way to the moon and sp flew around the moon and took pictures of the back side of the moon. Of course, we always call it the dark side of the moon, but in reality, whenever the front side of the moon is light, the back side's dark. Whenever the front side's dark, the back side's light. So if you were looking at the moon from the back side, every 28 days you'd see the moon have more and less light, just like if we're used to looking at the front side. 1959, the U.S. didn't even have a human in space yet. So that's what I think is fun about 1957 didn't even have a human in space yet. In fact, the USSR didn't even have a human in space. So how do you think it made the military leaders in the United States, and just so we're clear here, we're full-blown by the late 50s. We're full-blown into the Cold War. So what do you think the military leaders in the United States are thinking about Sputnik and uh, Luna, the Luna 2 missions? What's that? Yeah, they're thinking about the missiles that the USSR is making and how good are they compared to the ones the United States is making. In fact, Sputnik was huge. You ought to write that down. Sputnik, this scared the public in the United States because it was broadcast around the world. It was a big news story, and people were scared. Holy mackerel, there is a country that has nuclear weapons that doesn't like us, and we don't like them. And they launched a, a, a mechanical device, and it is flying around the Earth and flying over the United States, and we can't do anything about it. So here's 1050 with a Chinese gentleman. I like his outfit. I, I personally like the hat and the mustache, but that's just me. And here's uh, Robert Goddard with his first liquid-fueled rocket in 1926 in the snow and the hat he's got the cool hat right here's a V2 launching uh, I can't swear where this was launched but this is the way Germany painted them white and black so it's easy to take pictures of them from a long distance while you were tracking it you'd point the camera up it was a liquid fueled rocket here's a picture of Sputnik so that's a good I guess that's a good solid two feet in diameter so four antennas. All it was was a radio transmitter and a battery. Well, we were afraid of, yes, to answer your, the question is, were, was, the, was the public of the United States afraid of that? And the answer is yes. Not because specifically of that, oh, no, it's going to But because of the proof, the capability of the USSR at that moment to launch and the United States about it. What if it wasn't a radio and what if it was something else? So what do you think that happened in the United States after Sputnik? Do you think maybe it changed how the United States defense and the U.S. government spent its money on space and on intercontinental ballistic missile development? I think it had a huge impact. Say that again, please. Oh, the movie Hidden Figures? Yeah, I believe. I haven't seen it. I've seen some trailers on it. That movie is about, uh, is about specifically about female African Americans in the United States space program who were mathematicians and did math problems because we had computers back then. And they were calculating if you have this much thrust and you aim the rocket this way and it weighs this much and here's the gravity of the Earth. They were doing calculus like crazy. So they were extremely intelligent women. Or they were extremely intelligent people. Um, but that was right, at, right after this. That was in the early 1960s when the United States was starting to put humans inside of spaceships. So here's what the rocket that launched the Sputnik. And if you look at later rockets by the Soviet Union, they all look a lot like this. There's one cylinder in the middle, and then you can see four kind of cones near the bottom, and there's engines in each, each one of those cones. And there's a picture of the Luna 2. So this is what flew around the moon and took pictures. And I don't know which one of those things was a camera. All right, the first Human to get into space, 1961, about two years after the first machine went around the uh, moon. 
what I think is rather interesting is that on Yuri Gagarin's very first flight, he didn't just go up and come down, which is what the United States did with Colin Shepard. He went up, and I think he did two spins around the Earth. I think he did, he did, I think he did more than one, but I'm not positive. You think he did two? Three? Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's about the space race, and it's in the middle of the Cold War. Yeah, there's that movie. I suppose I ought to watch that movie instead of tripping into, uh, into uh, what is that, a stool. All right, so I think that's interesting that boat, that, you, that, that that exact same flight wasn't just a first person in space. They didn't just go up and come down. They went into orbit. And you notice I didn't even write in here the U, first U.S. human in space because that was Alan Shepard. You don't have to write it down. Alan Shepard, he went up and he came down, 15 minutes. It was in space, you know, went up, I don't know how many miles. It was, don't get me wrong, it was space. But the Soviet Union totally kicked the United States' butt in getting, not just getting human into space first, but doing uh, an orbit around the Earth. There was a nice ticker tape parade and all that stuff in New York City, and then, I can't recall, a year or two later, John Glenn sent with a bigger rocket. It was the first. And it was a big ticker tape parade. But hey, poor you, he ended up dying in a jet airplane accident. Uh, I don't know if it was 10 or 15 years later. Wow, check it out. First spacewalk. Boss Cod 2, 1965. Spacewalk is mean where you get into a space, a space suit and you open up a little valve and you let the air out of the space capsule. And then you open the door of the space capsule and you climb out with your air and hoses and stuff connected from the space suit to the capsule. And you're like floating in space looking down at the Earth. You're going 17, some thousand miles an hour. And you think you're going to fall down and you try not to puke. I'm sure they, I, I don't know, I've never been an astronaut. That would be my only concern about being an astronaut is I'd make sure I had a sick sack with me just in case because you don't want that stuff floating around inside the capsule when there's zero gravity, right? Hey, anybody ever hate that one? Well, never mind. I'll describe it. In any case, first spacewalk, well, what country is the USSR? Does that mean the United States of South Rhode Island? No, that's, that's, that's the Soviet Union. Oh, wait, check it out. Six years later, now granted, the moon is on another slide. The moon is on another slide, so one might argue maybe you need to stuff it in here. It is right between 1965 and 1971. The first humans to go on the moon, that was totally 1969, and that was the U.S. But I wanted to make a point here. Here's the first time, a space station. That is, let's put somebody up in a tin can with some oxygen, some water, and some food, and a place to put all their poo and all their pee, and give them some radios, maybe some books to read and some experiments to run, and then leave them up there and launch your, launch your spaceship and go back down to the planet. Go, see you, Fred. I'll be back in a couple of months. Man, so who did that? Was it the United States? No, it was the Soviet Union. It was the USSR. And I'm not trying to say this because I don't like the United States, and I'm not telling you all this because I like the Soviet Union. I just think that it's rather interesting that if the one way to look at uh, things that were occurring in the late 50s and early 1960s is the USSR was, ahead, was winning the space race. In fact, one could argue that until the United States landed somebody on the moon, the Soviet Union was in first place for the first 12 years, from 1957 to 1969. The United States was in second place. So that's what I find rather interesting about this slide. It's from 1957 to 1969 when Americans landed on the moon, the, the Soviet Union was winning the space race. And the fact that if you were in the U.S., yeah, I think it changed your perspective on how much money the federal government spent on rockets. So here's the Vostok one. There's the diagram of Yuri. That's not really Yuri. There's a picture of Yuri in the upper right-hand corner. Just big enough for one person to hang, a little window, rockets and oxygen and stuff like that. I'm not going to go into all the details. There's a picture of it. Woohoo! Go Yuri, man! Oh. Here's the spacewalk. Yeah, he's, he's trying to pedal with his feet. I don't know. I'm just kidding there. I couldn't find a picture. Oh, wait. There was nobody outside the capsule to take a picture. <laughs> Sorry. 
I guess I guess there's probably pictures of if you notice it's hard to see, but there's actually another astronaut in a spacesuit inside. I bet you there's pictures somewhere that that gentleman took of the spacewalk. The, just as an aside, the guy almost died. His spacesuit inflated and it expanded more than they thought, and he, it, he had a hard time clo- bending his arms to close the outer hatch. Of course, if you couldn't close the outer hatch, that means yeah, that means they'd have never been able to pressurize the air, the, the spaceship again. I hate, don't, you, don't you hate that when you die in space? So here is the space station, uh, Voskhod, on the far right, and there's a Soyuz or a Salyut, I can't remember which, on the left. This is an artist rendering of the first space station. That's the part on the right. So, of course, we have recovered. Let's talk about the moon. First, on the moon. 1959, we were able to cover that first fly by the moon by an artificial base out of the Soviet Union. Took pictures. 1960, next 66, the U.S. had done hadn't got anywhere hadn't got anywhere yet. Oh wait, and, and, and I'm not listing every single thing that happened on the moon. There were some rockets that flew and they took pictures and took pictures and they crashed into the moon prior to 1966, but the first vehicle to land on the moon and not crash, because it was designed to not crash, was Luna 9. So you could argue that the first pictures from the, the surface of the moon were also done by the USSR in 1966, and of course the first humans got to the moon in 1969. Three guys went, one guy stayed orbiting the moon, and two people went downstairs. Buzz Aldrin was one of those two guys that were first on the moon. He's still alive, and he's in his 80s, the most famous still-living uh, astronaut. I don't know who's, who's the next one in line. Gene Cernan, is he still alive? He, he was, he was, Gene Cernan was on Apollo 17. You don't have to write this down, but Apollo 17 was the last one. We got Apollo 11, 12, oops, 13 didn't make it there. They all came back, but they didn't go to the moon. 14, 15, 16, and 17. So we had six missions to the moon. And the last two or three or four of them, Leave it to America. We sent them up there with a car. Literally the moon rover. It was an electric car. Yeah. And one of the astronauts had a, golf, a couple of golf balls and a, and a, and a golf club. And he, probably the world's record. I bet you type in, wor, wor, not world, <laughs> solar system record for a golf shot. It's probably on the moon. It's probably like 10,000 yards or something stupid like that. So Mars. The first time anybody flew by Mars was the United States. Yay, the U.S. finally does something before the Soviet Union does. Flies by 1965, and although right now there, there are rovers walking around, walking around, rolling around on Mars. Anybody know what the names of those are? Curiosity is the name of the rover, but the missions, and at the moment it's escaping me, those, all those Mars missions, there's been several of them. Shucks, it's escaping me. But before then, when I was in 1976, I turned 16 in that year. I turned 16 in 1976. That's when the first time anything landed on Mars and sent back a picture. So literally, it takes the United States until we land on the moon in 69. The USSR is is undoubtedly the leader of the space race, and we finally start catching up. Finally start catching up. So this is a picture of uh, the Luna 2. Uh, before it landed, it's just a picture of a, probably a mock-up. It doesn't have the landing gear sticking out or everything. And then here's what we think it looked like. Whoops. Wrong way, wrong way. This one. The Luna 9 on the moon. So this is an artist's rendering of what the Luna 9 looked like. I thought I had a better picture. And of course, here's Apollo, Here's the Apollo missions, Saturn V rocket. We launched Apollo 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Make it to the moon, and then we had the uh, Skylab missions, where instead of putting the lunar lander in there, we put in a space station. And here's what it looked like after you. After you, this is what left the the, the orbit of the Earth. So you get up there. You, this first part on the left with the cylinder and the triangle, the, the the cone, the command capsule. You pull that out, rotate it around, and scooch in and grab a hold of the lunar module, and then you aim towards the moon and you fire that rocket and go to the moon. You enter the orbit of the moon. You're spinning around the moon, and then the lunar landing module, the, the lunar excursion module, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, 
the part on the right that looks all funky, it's not very aerodynamic, a lot of corners on it, that disconnects and lands on the moon. And then when they're done, the bottom half of that with the landing gear on it, that stays on the moon and just the top part comes up with a couple of astronauts and, I don't know, 50 or 100 pounds of moon rocks. And then, here's an interesting part, they leave that part there, the, uh, the lunar excursion module, or the, I'm not exactly sure what the name is. This part right here, this part, it takes off. So here, this part here stays on the ground. This part takes off, and then it goes back. So when it comes back up, there's just this part. After they take the people inside, the two astronauts inside, and all their moon rocks and stuff, they jettison this. And then this thing floats around in orbit until it degrades and hits the moon. I looked it up. In fact, one of the missions, they deliberately had this thing hit the moon near one of the landing sites where they had a seismograph, you know, to measure earthquakes, just to see if, see how, how what would happen if they hit it, how hard does it hit, and then how much does it shake the ground. Because they knew it was going to land anyway. They might as well figure, well, let's measure it, see how much of a smash-o it makes. Smash-o. That, that's not a real space term. Smash-o. So let's see, which one was that? I can't remember what that one is. Oh, the, the Mariner 4. This is the Mariner 4 right there, right here. There's Mariner 4. Let's go check out Mars. And then, uh, and this building is at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. It's down in L.A. Once or twice a year, Pasadena, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, they have an open house, and you can go tour the entire facility. And there's a ramp. They don't show it in this picture, but there's a visitor sent a visitor balcony on this room, and I got to walk on that visitor balcony. There was no satellites in it, but it was still cool. And then here's here's a Viking, or a, an artist diagram of what Viking would look like. The first thing to land on Mars softly and send back pictures. All right, so we're going to go through this rather rapidly. Venus, a flyby in 1962, but the Venera project that the USSR uh, had, they were actually the first uh, spaceship to actually land on Venus, and the first, uh, and there were several Veneras. I can't remember which student had the Venera uh, project. But do you remember which Venera it was that landed and took pictures? And sent and the pictures got back. I don't think it was Venera 2. It landed. 13, finally. Yeah. Yeah, so they kept sending a bunch. Sooner or later, one of them worked. Yeah. That's not pre very fun if it's an astronaut. Well, sorry, we sent seven missions with astronauts. None of them came back. But, hey, on our 13th try. Then, okay. All right. Finally ran Pioneer 10 past Jupiter in 1973, U.S. Galileo hit Jupiter the hard way in 1995. So that's a long way away. Jupiter's like ridiculous a long way away. Has anybody ever been to Jupiter? In your head? Yeah, I've seen the pictures. It looks awesome. I read, I read science fiction books about, about flying to Jupiter. The Mariner 10 went past Mercury in 1974. The U.S. crash landed a, an air, a spaceship in 1915. And Neptune Voyager went past in 1989. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are still out there. They're past, I think they're past Pluto now. They've been out there a long, long time. I think one of the, at least one of the two of them is still sending back signals. It's the one with the gold record on it that has sounds of humans and stuff and whales. and It's got Led Zeppelin on it. I'm just kidding. It doesn't have Led Zeppelin. I wish if, if somebody asked me what I'd put on it, I'd have put Stairway to Heaven on it. But I don't think that, but they certainly didn't ask me, and I believe they do not have any hard rock and roll on that record. Nobody's landed on Neptune yet. And this slide, I realize, is now uh, out of date because Cassini, uh, Cassini Huygens crash landed into, they did it on purpose, they went past the rings. And this year, calendar year 2017, they actually ran it into the atmosphere taking pictures until it couldn't take any pictures anymore. But it's been there for over a decade. It took a decade to get there, and then it's been flying around the moons, taking pictures of moons. Voyager went past Uranus, didn't land, and then New Horizons went past in 2015 and took a lot of awesome pictures of Pluto. No, no, no we haven't landed anything on Pluto, so there's no human germs on Pluto. Anybody have any questions? So, if we look back, so let's look at USA versus USSR.
So, let's see. Germany got the first thing cooking, you know, real rocket that actually did something. Then it was USSR, 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 USSR. And even if we put in USA, 1969, landing on the moon, then it's back to the USSR. USSR, USSR. Wow. So one could argue that the first half of the space race, the Soviet Union was ahead. Did the Soviet Union ever get their space shuttle working? Did they ever get it into the into space? No, they didn't. Did they ever land anything on? Did they ever get a human on the moon? No, but they did try, and that's a whole other story. They had rockets built. They just kept blowing up before they put somebody on top of it. Every time, literally, every time they tried to launch the equivalent of what was an Apollo ship, it blew up. So they said, "Ah, forget about it. Let's just build more nuclear missiles." But now let's talk about the 70s. 1976 is Viking. Oh, let's see. Go First to go past Venus. Oh, wait, there's a landing on Venus by the USSR. First to go to Jupiter, U.S. First to land on Jupiter, U.S. First to Mercury, U.S. Neptune, U.S. Oh, wow, the outer planets. U.S. 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 Okay. So who do you think won the second half of the space race? Yeah, okay. So now it would be interesting, and I haven't researched this, where is most of the development in space technology happening? Let's put it this way. Compared to, think about all these rocket ships that we've sent. Let's just say for fun, or let's just say there's, say there's 100. Everything that, you know, China actually. So if we count that, you know, and we count all these other missions, it's 100 machines that have either passed another planet or, or landed on another planet or moon. And I number it would be kind of interesting to look that up. How many satellites are orbiting the Earth? Is it 100? More, more, a little more, a little less? A little more, you think? How many a little more? I don't know. There's 26 satellites just in the GPS system. The Soviet Union has their GPS system. The European Space Agency, or maybe it's not their space agency, but they're putting up a third GPS-type system. Yeah, I'm sure it's in the thousands. Thousands. I mean, just think about Dish TV. Dish TV comes down off of a satellite. It was like a big deal in the 1960s when a communications satellite went up. I think it was Telstar. And you could talk on the phone from somebody in the United States to Europe. And it was really clear, and it wasn't going through 3,000 miles of copper wire. Yeah, Brandon. SpaceX, yeah. Ver yeah, it's SpaceX. I think SpaceX is awesome. My, my son turned me on to SpaceX. His dream job is to go to work for SpaceX and sit in the mission control. He's got some color blindness, so he, uh, he, he's not likely to be an astronaut. He's too old. He's... He's 31 now, so he hasn't been flying a lot of jets, so it's kind of late for him to be an astronaut. But, yeah, SpaceX, their first stage rocket, the big rocket on the bottom, they get up, you know, like, I don't know how far it is. You know, it's like two, three, four minutes into the flight. The rest of the okay, first stage comes back down, and they pop out a couple of fins on the bottom, some grids, and they use they, they fall down in control, and they can have landing on the landing, on the launch site. Just before it gets to the ground, it starts blowing, turning the rockets back on, and it lands. They've even landed at least once or twice or three times on a moving ship. Yeah. And they have a contract with the NASA to send capsules with cargo and water. More than one occasion. And one of the last ones they did, the capsule, they reused it. And that's the, that's the whole, what, what SpaceX is trying to do, to bring down the cost of space travel by not just throwing it away after you used it once. It's, let's inspect it, let's fix anything that's wrong, and let's put it back into service and do it again. That's why airplanes, let's put it this way, if, if uh, there's a good YouTube on video, if you took a 747 in California and then you had to throw it away, you'd have to charge all the passengers a half of a million dollars to cover the cost of, bu of buying another 747. So it's kind of nice if you can land and refuel, do an inspection, put some air in the tires, and take off and do it again. So if you can do that with space machines, then that's awesome. 
And and Mr. Musk, who's the CEO of, uh, he's all, not just the CEO of SpaceX, you know, tech company, put something onto Mars in 2024. And about six months ago or more, the rich people in the United States and they said in 2018, they're going to do it with SpaceX. They're going to fly. I'd send somebody up there that knew where all the buttons and stuff were. It's got to be a ridiculous amount of money. Hey, you know, really, it's a couple of That's, Has anybody ever heard of that term, e, an e-ticket ride? Hey, I know this is before you were born. If you went to Disneyland, it wasn't just one entrance fee and you get a ride on anything you want that you're willing to wait in a line for. At Disneyland, they had an A, B, C, E, and an E tickets, and you buy a book of them. It had a lot of A's, and then less and less and less, and then you had like two or three E tickets. But the E ticket rides were the really good ones. Like today, right now, I'd say Space Mountain. Has anybody ever been to Disneyland? Okay, one person. All right. Well, their best rides were the E ticket rides. So there was a, a common phrase 20, 30 years ago. How good was it? Oh, yeah, it was an E ticket ride because it was like the best there was. So I think flying around the moon, even if you don't get a land, how many people would jump in a spaceship and go fly around the moon? And it'll take like, you know, like, uh, I think it's three days, or two days, maybe it's a day and a half there. A day. This is the last, this is one of the last slides. Maybe it is the last slide. So what can you do with satellites? Well, literally, one of the first, I mean, the very first satellite, and when I say satellite in this case, I'm talking about an artificial satellite, because technically the moon is a satellite of the Earth. We just usually call them moons instead of satellites. So really, I'm talking about artificial satellites or man-made satellites. Communications, likely, it certainly was the very first thing. The first satellite, Sputnik, it had a radio transmitter. And some of the first lights, they were they were uh, receiver and retransmitters. I want to get I, you transmit up a signal to the satellite, it receives it, and then turnarounds and retransmits it to another spot on the Earth. You know, in a split second. Another use for satellites, I bet you, I hope on here. See how many, see how many, I didn't look at this slide. Is weather, right? Is there weather satellites on there? Okay, awesome. Yay. So at least I know, one, I, know, I know one of them. And, of course, if you're not familiar with the global positioning system, I'll just give you, I'll give you the one-minute version. So there's 24 satellites. They usually have two or three extra on top of that, like 6 or 27 for spares in case. GPS receiver in your phone, right? Who has a phone but it doesn't have a GPS receiver in it? Yeah, it's like standard equipment for the last five or eight years. All right, this GPS signal. GPS be four, five, or six. And the satellite, the data that's coming from the satellite, is telling your phone where the satellite is. But the satellite's moving. These aren't in geosynchronous orbit. They're not just sitting there over California. They're all saw 24 of them or 26 of them are flying around. And, but it, it says, the satellite says, here I am, and, you, and, and, and it tells you the time that it sent its signal. So the, your phone is actually calculating how long it took for that satellite to get to you. And then another satellite, it sends information down, here I am, and the cell phone is counting how long it takes for the, for the satellite to get there. And if you throw five satellites, it's even more accurate. I, did, I crunched the numbers one time, and your cell phone, if you if you took a brand, let's take a brand new what's Samsung up to, Galaxy S7, they're up to 8. And what's the latest iPhone? It's like the iPhone X, It's but it's the 8. In any case, let's take either one of these phones. If you could open it up, computer inside it, running the show, 
and you chopped it up into about a hundred pieces, that one one hundredth of that chip was more computer than was Apollo 11. Because tubes would have taken too much power and too much weight. So we had transistors. I don't know if we had integrated circuits yet, and we didn't have players of integrated circuits. So literally, the power of your cell phone would run a hundred Apollo missions. Easy. There's a lot of satellites orbiting the Earth. Keep going. Now, do they crash? The answer is not very often. I think in the last five or ten years, there's been one satellite hit another satellite. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about uh, debris. You're talking about the little tiny pieces? Right. It was two big satellites they hit, and now there's 500 pieces. But they're still out there floating around. Now, if you hit two satellites hit something slow down enough, they won't stay in orbit. And that's a really big problem. Space debris is a really, really big problem because let's say you're orbiting in one direction. Space debris, let's say it's the size of a golf ball, is going in the other direction. You're going 20,000 miles an hour. It's going 20,000 miles an hour. Golf ball hitting the side of your car. Not at 20 miles an hour. Not at 200 miles an hour. Not at 2,000 miles. Oh, wait, sorry, four. Not at four. Not 4,000 miles an hour. You think that golf ball is going to go right smack through your car and anything in it? Yeah, it might even go through the engine. That's not good if you're in a spaceship. I mean, it's not good if you're a satellite, but it's really, really not fun if you're in an international spaceship or you're in a, a space capsule or a shuttle. So people pay, there are people, and their whole job is to be a mathematician and calculate where all these things are going and where they're going to be in a day, an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year. Yeah. That's one of the biggest problems with continuing advancements in space or in orbiting things is how do you put something up there and then not have something that's already there hit it? So you want to go into a great career, there, is, there are careers out there to be mathematicians and figure that stuff out. Don't worry, you take like two math classes a semester across four years of, of college. And that's eight semesters times two math classes. That's 16 math classes. And then you go to college and get your graduate degree and do it for two more years. Good job like that. So if you like math or if you like computers with math, then you're in the right place. Me, I like wiggling sticks and looking out the window at little tiny cars on the ground and going, ha, eh, eh, ha, I'm up here and you're not. I hardly ever say that, just so you know. I mean, I think it. Ha, ha, I'm up here. But. All right. Dish TV. Television. And I don't think television is used. Television is used mostly to sell advertising, but for the consumer, it's to watch things that are fun. So satellite dishes. You probably don't remember that uh, satellite dishes used to be bigger. Today, satellite dishes are maybe two feet across, 18, 20, 20 feet across, but when flight TV came out, these satellites were 10 feet in diameter. Ten, I'm not making this up. 10 feet, that's, that's a, a big, as big a diameter as this, maybe a little bit more than this ceiling. And people in the city, it, you didn't like putting one of those in. But most people that did it, they had broadcast television over the, over the radio, over radio waves, so it was a lot of people out in the country that couldn't get TV and, and, and cable didn't get out there. But the size has come down. Now satellites, holy mackerel. I have a little box. I wish it could me. It's, it's about the size of this wallet, but it's about twice as thick. Yeah, you know, it's not even in my car. And, it's, and actually the newer versions are not even twice, are smaller than this and not twice as thick. And it's, a, it's a, got a GPS. And I, I have one. Velcro on the instrument panel on the dashboard. And I turn it on, 
and I push one butt, I put a button on it to send a sample signal so my foot will show up in my phone so I know it's working. And I put it up there. It's got a GPS. So in about a 30 seconds or a minute, because it's really low power, so the, product, the computer in it is not really fast. So your phone, if you turn it on, you probably get GPS signal in 5 or 10 or 20 seconds. This thing, it takes about 30 seconds or so. But it's two AA batteries. You can only use lithium. And it keeps getting GPS signals, and it keeps remembering, oh, this is where I am. Oh, this is where I am. Oh, this is where I am. And if you push the OK button, it'll transmit to satellite phone satellites, like a text message. And it'll say, here's the serial of this machine, and here is the position we are. And back down, the satellite receiver goes into the and a computer, and then the computer will send a text message and an email that's on your list that's or, that you already pre-programmed. So you can put eight on the my system, cell phone, text numbers, and emails, and it'll show up and it'll say. This is from John Johnson, and it'll say, you can actually, you can type in there, you have about 140 words, it's kind of like, and my is in this message, and it's in your email. And here's what's cool, on the email, email up, and you click, it opens up Google Maps, there's a second button, if you push that button, it's the it's it's got a different message in it, and to me, it's the, it, you get whatever you want. When I if I push that button, it says, "No medical attention is needed, but please come and get me. I'm stuck." So like if I'm and I take this sometimes when I go camping or hiking. So if somebody breaks their leg, well then it's medical attention. But if you're, you're come get me. In. You push that button, and it goes. It sends your GPS location up to the 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 satellite phone, and uh, it goes to a rescue center in Texas. And see where you are, and it says, "Oh, it's the 9/11 signal." They will call local law law enforcement and search and rescue in your area and tell you where you are. You've got it listed as an airplane. They will say it's a white airplane with yellow trim. And they are, they are in immediate need. They, this is a 911 call. And so if you're out in the country, they'll call the sheriff. They'll call the civil patrol. They'll call the county fire department. And they'll all start coming looking for you. It's awesome. This box is $100. And it's $150 a year for this service. And you can put that on the top of So if you're on a, a hiking trip or a flying trip, all you got to do is reach up. Hey, don't push the 911. You can push the other button every 5 or 10 or 15 minutes, and people can know where you are. So I think that's pretty awesome. That's, that's communication and positioning. We're almost done here with this slide, otherwise we'd break already. Earth data. And when I say earth data, in addition to weather, you can look down at the earth and see where the water is. You can see where the land is. You can see where the plants are. You can go up there with an infrared sensor and see how hot it is everywhere or how cold it is. Anybody ever look at Google Maps and hit the satellite view? Satellite? What's that mean, Mr. Johnson? It means there was a satellite that took a picture of my car in the driveway two years ago, and I don't have that car anymore. The picture of the airport in Prescott, Arizona, on Google Maps about six months ago, they took it when my airplane was there. So if you know where to, where to look, you can zoom in and see the airplane with white wings and yellow trim. But at the Reedley Airport, for some reason, it's not there yet. It's been sitting out there for seven months. It's just they just haven't updated the picture of Reedley International Airport. Yeah. You can get data for fun for Google Maps. But now if you want to think ahead and kill the bad people or blow up the things they're making so they can't kill you, 
Does anybody think there are military satellites that take really, 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 really good pictures that are way, 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 way better than Google? Only one person? Oh, okay, a couple more. All right. Yeah. There, there were satellites in the 1960s that the United States launched that were secret satellite launches. So the United States could take pictures of the Soviet Union and all their allies. You think the Soviet Union was launching satellites to fly over the United States to take pictures? Yeah, huh. So I want to tell you an interesting thought. Think about that. Let's say you're in the Soviet Union and you fly over a U.S. military base that has bombers and they're on nuclear. And tensions are in the country. And when you fly, and they're all in their right way, and it's older engines and they smoke, and they all have smoke coming out of the engines. What do you get if you're the USSR? You're thinking that the United States is preparing for a nuclear attack and it's a higher level of. DEFCON than was before. I bet you the U.S. could do the same thing. What if you flew over after you took that picture, you come back a couple hours later, and all the airplanes are gone? Hmm. Either they're flying around with some troops on the way, or they're repositioning them to another base where they are, so it's harder for you to drop your nukes on them. So you can do a lot of things with that data, either nicely or not nicely. So let's take a break. We'll say it is uh, 16 after. So 16 plus 10 is 26. Please come back here at uh, 26 after on a real clock.